Good morning and welcome. Welcome this morning to Faith Reformed Church. It's great to be here. Beautiful. August 1st, Sunday morning. My wife, Kathy, had to remind me of that this morning. It's August. Summer's almost over. Uh, but it's a beautiful day. It's great to be here, worship together, to sing some songs, to, to look into God's word, to celebrate this morning and remembering Holy Communion. Uh, um, so we just appreciate the time that we can have together. You know, as we study, and, and I've been here, uh, and we're working through this morning again in Ecclesiastes, sometimes it can get a little depressing and a little, uh, little down on some of the scripture that we're reading in the Old Testament. But I want to start this morning with a word of encouragement from Proverbs. It's Proverbs chapter 3, the first uh, eight verses. It says, My son, do not forget my teaching, but keep my commands in your heart. For they will prolong your life many years and bring you prosperity. Let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Then you will win favor and a good name in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your paths straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. This will bring health to your body and nourishment to your bones. Let's begin our service this morning with prayer. Father, we thank you for the time this morning that you've, right from the beginning of creation, carved out a section of the days that you created to rest and to worship and to fellowship with you, our Lord our Heavenly Father, and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, we don't want to take that lightly today. We truly want to worship you. We want to have fellowship, not just with each other in this congregation, but with you as our Father and our Savior. Lord, bless the time this morning. I know people have, have uh, uh, put time and effort into preparing the worship songs, the music, the message, the communion, all those things that sometimes we take for granted. Lord, set aside this next hour in our hearts and our minds to truly worship you. We pray these things in your name. Amen. As the worship team comes forward this morning, let's stand up, take a few minutes, just shake hands and greet each other this morning, and then be prepared to sing.
Thank you for that singing this morning. Just a reminder of how the Lord really needs to reign in our hearts and be in control of our lives. Well, it's great to be back here again this morning. Uh, and we're continuing our study in the book of Ecclesiastes. So if you brought your Bibles, make sure to turn there. Uh, hopefully some of the, the scripture will be up on the screens as well. But um, it's great to be studying the Old Testament. I... Uh, and I, I know I've said this before, but I enjoy the New Testament so much, and I enjoy preaching out of the New Testament. But this summer I thought, you know, I'm, I'm going to go back to the Old Testament. And, and that's why I had to read this, this uh, proverb earlier about wisdom and, and the encouragement about that. Because sometimes when we look at especially Ecclesiastes, it gets kind of depressing. And we're going to see that again today uh, in chapter 4. There's... There's just, you know, he, 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 Solomon spoke about wisdom and financial things and teachings and relationships, and it's all vanities, all chasing after the wind, it's all smoke and all these things, and it's like, well, what really are we supposed to do? Uh, well, chapter 4 is more the same, so to speak. Just wait, though, just wait. A couple weeks, chapter 5. Chapter 5 is a little more encouraging, but today we're still in chapter 4 of Ecclesiastes. The title of my message is, uh, this morning is simply, Where is my life going? Where is my life going? Uh, and we talked uh, the first couple chapters really about uh, getting this proper perspective on life. This, this life that we live, the short short time in all of eternity that we call our life. And really the perspective that we need to look at is not just from Ecclesiastes, but really for the whole context of the Bible. Uh, so we can't be uh, on, only pick out verses of this one book and say, well, eat, drink, and be merry. Yeah, sounds great. Well, there's other contexts that that goes in, for example. Uh, so really, chapter 1, we kind of talked about this proper perspective and realizing that one thing is for certain, eventually we're all going to die. Uh, the cycle of life is going to end for all of us. And so if we live in the light of that, in that perspective, we can live our life a little bit differently. We can live it uh, a little more freely, a little more generously, with a bigger heart and so forth. And we, we, we would do then certain things differently realizing that we do all eventually die. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. We have hope even in our death through Jesus Christ. Well, chapter 2 uh, really talked about that right relationship with God. And we will receive a deep joy when we are in that relationship. And all these other things in the world that we strive after and try to achieve and try to accomplish really doesn't bring us the joy and the happiness uh, that we would desire. And we really need to understand that life is a gift from God and not just an opportunity for our selfishness or for our own personal gain. Chapter 3, we talked about uh, uh, so many different little pieces. And if you just turn back, uh, a time for everything. And it just talked about a time for everything, all the different uh, uh, circumstances and experiences that we have in our life. A time to be born, a time to die, a time to, 
to love, a time to hate, a time to gain, a time to lose, and so forth. And, and all of these things, all of these individual stories and experiences in our life, many times we don't understand that significance at the time, or maybe not at all, until we reach heaven. But each one of those tiny little pieces uh, eventually will lead up to a purpose and a plan for our life. And only God sometimes knows the answer. So today we're going to continue on with chapter 4 of, of Ecclesiastes. And we're going to look at, I, I wrote down on the outline, four different things. Uh, and that outline's in your bulletin and it'll be up on the screens as well. Uh, but again, just the, uh, a lot of circumstances, a lot of life, and according to Solomon, um, sometimes it's just vanity, sometimes it's meaningless, but eventually we will see the outcome of it. Father, we just thank you for your word today. Thank you for the opportunity to, to look into the principles and the truth that you preserve for us in your holy word, the scripture, the Bible. Lord, thank you that we have the freedom to read it, to look at it, to understand it. Lord, you've given us counsel through your Holy Spirit to reveal when it's right and appropriate the mysteries and the understanding that will help us live our lives, not just today, not just tomorrow, but into the future. We pray these things, Lord, in your name. Amen. So my title this morning is, Where is Your Life Going? And number one on your outline there, I just wrote down this, the reality of oppression. And see, I said it was going to be a little bit depressing this morning. Let's read those first couple verses, uh, chapter 4, verses 1 to 3. Again, I saw all the oppression that was taking place under the sun. I saw the tears of the oppressed, and they had no comforter. Power was on the side of the oppressors, and they had no comforter. And I declared that the dead who had already died are happier than the living who are still alive. But better than both is he who has not yet been born, who has not seen the evil that is done under the sun. <laughs> We're going to stop there. <laughs> what a terrible place to stop. We can't stop there. How depressing. But the reality is, I mean, let's face it. We all know. We've lived life. We're in the middle of life. We watch the news. We know the events. There is oppression going on, right? We can't deny it. We would prefer that it doesn't happen. And, and we try our best to, to not only avoid it, but to, to minimize it. But that's the reality of life. And Solomon here is really at his lowest point. And in verse 3, he says, well, <laughs> better if I wasn't even born. You know, I thought of that this week. And is that really true? You know, once in a while, may, maybe you've said it, I've said it. And not, not so much about human life, but in, in animal life, I know I've said it for sure. It would be better if that calf would not be born, right? I used to dairy farm, okay? 20 years, 15, 17 years, whatever. I grew up on a farm, and then we farmed. And we had many dairy cows, and I saw many calves being born. The majority were very healthy, live, grew up to be. But some were deformed. Some were so sickly or weak or, or deformed or, or premature or whatever, and, and it Eventually, they died anyways, that calf, and it would have been just better if they weren't even born, right? Well, from a human perspective or from an animal perspective, that's probably true. But now we think of, of, of humans, of people, and sometimes in our culture, people say that same thing about, about human beings, Oh, it would be better if they weren't even born. In fact, it's my choice that I will not have this baby. Or, or oh, I saw the, 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 the bad report on the ultrasound and we're, we're going to decide not to have this baby. It would be better. It'd be better for all of us if he or she wasn't born. Is that really true? Was that really God's plan in all of that? 
See, that's why we need to take Scripture as a whole, and that's why I wanted to read Proverbs as we started this morning. Because if we just look at these couple verses and say, well, okay, yeah, Solomon, the wisest man that ever lived, said it's better off not to be born, maybe that's what it should be. But then the, the rest of Scripture says, no, 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 that is not God's plan. God's plan is for this specific event or circumstances or trial or hardship to happen in my life and in your life and your family's life for a specific reason. Remember, last time we said we might not know that reason. And that's frustrating and confusing and, and creates hardship on us immediately. But God knows. Let me go back. I want to I wanna read Psalm 73 here because this, this brings us into perspective. This sheds light on this very depressing verse 3. Psalm 73 says this, Surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost slipped. I had nearly lost my foothold, for I had envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. They have no struggles. Their bodies are healthy and strong. See, he's talking about the oppressed here. And, and it's the seemingly advantage that the oppressed have. They are free from the burdens common to man. They are not plagued by human ills. Therefore, pride is their necklace. They close themselves with violence. From their callous hearts comes iniquity. The evil conceits of their minds know no limits. They scoff and speak with malice. In their arrogance, they threaten oppression. Their mouths lay claim to heaven and their tongues take possession of the earth. Therefore, their people turn to them and drink up waters in abundance. They say, how can God know? Does the Most High have knowledge? This is what the wicked are like. Always carefree. They increase in wealth. Surely in vain I have kept my pure heart. In vain I have washed my hands in innocence. All day long I have been plagued. I have been punished every morning. See, he's, he's contrasting the... It seems like... And sometimes this is our perspective. It seems like the wicked, the people that lie and cheat and, and step on other people have an advantage. In fact, they're wealthy, they're prosperous, they seem to be doing better. And, and, and me, poor humble me, I try to live in God's principles and look what happens. Continuing on in verse 13, if I had said I will speak thus, I would have betrayed your children. When I tried to understand all this, it was oppressive to me until I entered the sanctuary of God. Then I understood their final destiny. Until I entered the sanctuary of God, then I will understand. Surely you place them on slippery ground. You cast them down to ruin. How suddenly are they destroyed, completely swept away by terrors. As a dream, when one awakes, so when you arise, O Lord, you will despise them as fantasies. When my heart was grieved and my spirit embittered, I was senseless and ignorant. I was a brute beast before you. Yet I am always with you. You hold me by my right hand. You guide me with your counsel. And afterward, you will take me into glory. See, that's the promise. That's, that's why I need, we need to take the whole counsel of God. Here's, here's the, the, not the opposite, but the reassurance that as we live through oppression, whether we experience it or others experience it, we can also trust and hope in God in his counsel, in his ultimate glory. The fact that he's always going to be with us. Whom have I in heaven but you, and on earth has nothing I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is my strength of my heart and my portion forever. Those who are far from you will perish. You will destroy all who are unfaithful to you. But as for me... It is good to be near God. 
I have made the sovereign Lord my refuge. We need to balance the depressing oppression that Solomon speaks about in Ecclesiastes with the hope that the sovereign Lord will protect us, will heal us, will be our comfort and refuge. It says he will always hold me in his right hand. You know, this, this life, and I've said this before, and we really don't deserve anything. We're not entitled to wealth or prosperity or a good relationship or health or, or, or a church family. That We're not entitled. We don't deserve any of that. That is truly by God's grace. The fact that, that Christ can forgive our sins and wash us clean as snow, and then by His grace and mercy, He sheds those things, He gives those things to us. We don't deserve them. It's a gift. So we should only in return embrace life rather than be bitter about it or, or, or treat it lightly. We should be living for God out of reverence and obedience because He truly is the sovereign God. He truly is the one that will hold us and protect us. Even in, a, even in the times of oppression and confusion and mystery and pain, God is truly only that pathway to joy and to happiness and peace and contentment. Sometimes there are no answers. We can't fix everything. We can only rely and trust on the sovereignty of God. We can only rely and trust on the sovereignty of God. Let's go back to Ecclesiastes and continue chapter 4. Number 2 on your outline, I just wrote down, at the top, alone. (laughs) At the top, alone. Solomon goes on to say in verse 4, And I saw all labor and all achievement spring from man's envy of his neighbor. This too is meaningless, a chasing after a win. The fool folds his hands and ruins himself. Better one handful with tranquility than two hands full with toil and chasing after the wind. Again, I saw something meaningless under the sun. There was a man all alone. He had neither son or brother. There was no end to his toil, yet his eyes were not content with his wealth. For whom am I toiling, he asked. And why am I depriving myself of enjoyment? This too is meaningless, a miserable business. At the top, alone. Why do we do it? Like verse 8, there was a man all alone, but he achieved everything. You've all heard the saying, keeping up with the Joneses, right? I don't know if that's... uh, if you guys do that in Wisconsin Rapids, but we sure do that up in Edgar, okay? <laughs> now, none of you have ever, I don't think, met my dad, but, but he, was, he was great at that. I mean, if the neighbor got a new tractor, we, at some point, had to get a new tractor. And if it was 65 horse, we had to get a 75 horse power tractor. And if it was two-wheel drive, we had to get a four-wheel drive tractor. And if we got a 12-foot hay bind, we had to get a 16-foot hay bind. I mean, there was no end to it, right? And it's still that way. My brother and his, his son farms, and it's still that way. Now, instead of 12-foot, it's 32-foot. And, you know, it's, it's, instead of a big combine, it's a huge combine. It's just there's no end to it, right? We're that way in our business, too. We, we started out with one truck. Then we had two, 
and we had three, and we got more. <laughs> One trailer, and we got a lot. We keep up with the joint. We, and sometimes that's okay. We're going to talk about that. Is that okay to do that? Keeping up? Not just keeping up, but exceeding? To gain, to achieve, to, to relentlessly pursue something? Maybe it's a relationship. Maybe it's wealth. Maybe it's a prestige. But unfortunately, it's a place that we, this, this relentless pursuit of this neighbor, if you will, above us, but unfortunately, we're, we're stepping on somebody below us to raise ourselves up. That's where the problems come in. When we pursue gain because we think that's, there, there's more to be had, that's all there is to be had, Others are getting hurt in the process. We're dragging, at times, other people down and, and taking from them so we can have more. And, and it makes us feel good about ourselves because I have a little bit more than he does, but not quite as much as the next level. Deep in our hearts, we want to be noticed and we want to be the focus on attention. It's, it's all about selfishness, isn't it? This, this achievement, this success, this wealth, this toiling labor, like they were saying here. But it's really a, a matter of attitude, isn't it? Or motive. Because again, balance... The context of Scripture, many places in the New Testament, Paul and others talk about, uh, uh, even Jesus himself is quoted, it's, it's not money, it, it's it, the root of all evil. It's that motive, why do I need, what am I using my wealth for? It's a matter of attitude or motive. Are you gaining and striving and pursuing these things out of, out of spite or out of bitterness or out of revenge or envy, out of pride or, or arrogance? Or are you trying to please someone or, or, or something or others for your own selfish gain? That's what Solomon is talking about here. That, that's meaningless. That's, that's chasing the wind. You're alone at the top. Or... Contrast that with, are you using God's blessings? Remember, it's a gift from God. Maybe your abilities, maybe your, your management expertise, maybe your ability to, to sell or relate to people, maybe some, uh, some unique gifts that he's given you to the fullest ex extent, managing and stewarding God's resources to the benefit, not of yourself only, but to others. Then, then you're doing God's will. Then it's no longer meaningless because you're not just selfishly trying to gain something. You're managing, stewarding God's resources for the benefit of others. So it's really that contrast between being alone and doing, uh, trying to gain all these things for selfish purposes with the attitude and the motive of, of I want to do the best I can with the abilities that God has given me and the resources that he's allowed me to manage, not just for my benefit, but for others. And you can, you can plug in any illustration you want. You can say that's in the family, that's in the church, that's in the business, that's, that's out on the mission field, that's whatever, wherever you are. What is your motive? What is your attitude as you do that? And I don't want to miss verse 6 here. Let's go back to verse 6. Better one handful with tranquility than two hands full with toil and chasing after the wind. 
we usually think tomorrow is going to be better than life today, right? Because tomorrow we'll have achieved something new. We've, we've checked the box. We've crossed off this problem. We've, we've got rid of this bad relationship when we started this new relationship. We've, we've achieved something greater. But instead of living like that, like hopefully tomorrow will be better than today, why not just stop and enjoy life today? Can we do that in our 21st century culture? It's hard. <laughs> it's hard. Stop chasing the wind. Stop thinking that the future is going to be better and bigger and bolder and easier. If only things were different. But we don't know what the future lies. Maybe this is the best day of your life. Have you ever thought of that? Remember, let's think of the first couple chapters. Maybe this is the best day of my life because when I leave here, I might get in a car accident and die. <laughs> I hope not. But think of that. Instead of longing for a life that we think and wish and hope for, but we really can't control, can we just stop and enjoy the life God has given us today, right this minute? You know, we're going to do that this afternoon, Kathy and I. When we leave here, we're going to have an enjoyable afternoon with our granddaughters. Right? I know, right? Four little girls. I guess their parents are coming along too, but <laughs> we're going to take them to Bay Beach Amusement Park. Have any of you heard of that over in Green Bay? It used to be 10 cents a ride. I think the inflation has hit. I think it's 20 cents now. But so for 20 bucks, Grandpa is a god. <laughs> I mean, honestly. We, we'll be there all afternoon. And they'll go on the rides. Natalie was talking about it yesterday. She's looking forward to the big slide with the bumps in it. We're going to enjoy today. We're going to enjoy today. I hope you can do that too. And I know it. it I get it. Life isn't always easy. It's not always about fun. There's trials, there's hardships. I, I understand it. I really do. But let's enjoy today. God has given us today. Let's enjoy that the best we can. Well, let's move on. I know we got to keep going this morning. Number three on your outline, two are better than one. Well, let's contrast this now. Verse 8 he said there was this man all alone, right? And then he starts out in verse 9. Two are better than one because they have a good return for their work. If one falls down, his friend can help him up, but pity the man who falls and has no one to help him up. Also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. So the contrast here now is between one selfish alone on the top has everything but very much alone versus two are better than one because of these reasons. They, they, they can find protection, they can find warmth, they can help each other. The value of life really is not what you earn or what you gain but, but who and whom you relate to. With that, it's not about what you buy necessarily, but about what you can give. We're given a simple presentation here, really, of why two is better than one, and, and even three is better yet. If you want to make money, do it with someone else. It, it'll, it'll be better. 
If you, if you want to be in a relationship, do it with someone else. It'll keep you warm. <laughs> you know, we use this. Here's a little insight about Kathy and I. 35 years ago, we used this couple of verses as part of our wedding vows. You know, and, and, it's, and it's very appropriate. In fact, people still do it today. But, but uh, it's not only the, the man and woman together, but the third strand then is God inter twining them, holding them, protecting them, keeping them uh, uh, not just warm physically, but stronger emotionally, bonding them together, making that marriage so much stronger than either one of them could do individually. Even unbreakable in the marriage covenant. But here's one thing that wasn't in our marriage vows that someone probably should have told us. Um, marriage is really just connecting two sinners for life. Nobody ever said that. We all talked about God intertwining and all this great stuff and we're in a covenant and we're bonded and we're not going to get divorced and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, <laughs> Kathy's almost the biggest sinner in the world. <laughs> and now I'm married to her. And I know she feels the same, but she can't talk this morning. So. <laughs> Isn't that true? Talk about oppression and toil and, and selfishness. Just look at a marriage crying out loud. And God expects us to have that husband and wife for life in the midst of both of us being sinners because two are better than one and three cannot be broken. That's why we're going to leave real quick after the service because I don't want you guys talking to Kathy about that, okay? Because <laughs> I'm sure she has a little bit of input about, about that. But isn't that true? I mean, that's a whole nother, that's a whole, marriage is a whole nother sermon. We're not going to get into that today. But I, I just wanted to say that is one thing that, that we use. And Kathy and I really, honestly, really believe that, that two are better than one. We talk about that often, and not just in marriage, but, but in business and relationships, uh, even in the church family. That's why we, that's why we have corporate church family worshiping together. It's great that we can all have an individual relationship with Jesus Christ. In fact, God desires that for us. Our, our heart is designed for that personal relationship. But the very next step in that relationship as a, as a believer, as a Christian, is to join a community of like-minded believers that we call a church. So that's not really a foreign Topic. In fact, that's the way the Bible designed church to be and marriage to be. All right, we need to keep going. The last couple of verses here, verses 13 through 16. I just wrote down on the outline, reflections of a leader. It's kind of one of those couple of verses here that you can just see this is an older gentleman writing, kind of reflecting on his life, some experiences, good and bad. And let's see what he says. Better a poor but wise youth than an old but foolish king who no longer knows how to take warning. The youth may have come from prison to kingship or he may have been in poverty within his kingdom. I saw that all who lived and walked under the sun followed the youth, the king's successor. There was no end to all the people who were before them, but those who came later were not pleased with his successor. This too is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. Kind of just a brief commentary on, on leaders or kings or, or, or people in authority. Some come from prestige and others come from very humble beginnings. Some are, are liked and are followed and appreciated. Others are not. 
but all leaders have a season, a cycle, and eventually will be forgotten and passed over to the next generation, the next great leader, and eventually will be forgotten again. The only way we can have lasting value is if we have God at the center of our life. Through all of these first four chapters, that's really the bottom line. If you take these verses, you can pull any one of these and take them out of context. And without God, it's very, very depressing. And in fact, what a, what a waste to live your life that way. So the only value is if God is at the center of of your life, at the center of everything that we're doing in life. Reverence and respect to God and, and a real devotion to serving Him, not myself, are the most important things. Without God, Solomon says, everything is meaningless. Everything is vanity. Everything is chasing the wind. we got to remember that. We got to remember that, and I know, you know, in a way that's very, very deep, and and in another way it's really actually very simple. If we live for God, if we have that perspective, God's perspective, not my perspective, not my opinion, not my selfish thoughts and gain. We have reverence and respect for the sovereignty of God. Well, next time we're going to continue with that because if you look ahead at chapter 5, it really does talk about, about standing in awe of God. And, and now, how, how, what is God's perspective on all of these things? Let's take Solomon, the wisest man, out of the picture and let's put God up on the pedestal where he belongs and then we'll see different results. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the time this morning. We thank you for your word. And, and it's challenging at times. It's hard. It's hard to, to understand the oppression and the, and the toiling, the work, the circumstances that we're in. Lord, sometimes you give us insight to that, and other times you don't. Lord, help us, help me, help these people here this morning accept that. We cannot control everything. We weren't made to do that. But Lord, help us to trust you as a sovereign God, as a God that is willing and able to protect us and hold us and comfort us and strengthen us whatever and whenever we need it. We pray these things, Lord, in your name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand as we sing our next hymn.
seated this morning, we have an opportunity to remember the Lord's table. Just a reminder of, of Christ's broken body and blood shed for us for the forgiveness of sins. The work that he did on the cross for each of us if we choose to have faith and believe in him. The bread was just a symbol of his broken body and, and the wine, the juice of his blood. How he suffered for us. I mean, and talk about oppression. Talk about uh, misjustice in the world. If that was ever the case, it was right there. How could God allow that? What was he thinking? And yet, we need to trust in the sovereignty of God. And we saw the, the result, the outcome. That was his plan for a, a world that was sinful beyond any sacrifice other than Jesus Christ himself. So that was the plan, that was the purpose right from the very beginning. So just another example of how we need to trust the sovereignty of God. And, and think of, uh, of the thousands of years, the Old Testament. Think of, of, of those people. They were wondering, <laughs> just like we're wondering, this mean today in my life? Well, they were wondering for hundreds, even thousands of years, when, why, where, how is the Messiah going to come? And God answered in the birth and the, and the ultimate death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So that's what we're going to remember and celebrate this morning. Certainly, if you are part of, of the congregation, if you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, you welcome to this table. Really, it's a confirmation. It's a, it's a remembrance of what Jesus has done for you. In a minute, we're going to walk up and, and the deacons and elders are going to help us distribute. If you're comfortable, feel free to come on up. And uh, if you want the individual servings at each of the doors, there's the individual cups with the wafer and juice in as well. So as the men come forward, I'm going to read... Uh, from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, the familiar uh, reminder talking, speaking about the Lord's Supper and how Paul reminded us uh, of, of what was going on and the true meaning of that. For I've received from the Lord what I passed on to you, the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed with bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup. This is the cup, the new covenant of my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, he gives us a little caution here will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment upon himself. That just simply says, as we partake this morning, first of all, we need a, a relationship, personal relationship with Jesus Christ by faith that he has forgiven my sin, that I am worthy to receive this. And secondly, we need just to examine ourselves. And that's something we need to do individually in my, in my own heart, in your own heart. Is there something right now that I need to confess personally, in my life, my actions? And, and, and the Bible gives us an opportunity to do that. It, do, it doesn't uh, disregard or, 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 or make us immune from taking this. Paul said, we have an opportunity now to examine ourselves, allow Christ to do his work, and then partake as a family. Father, we thank you that you have laid it out so clearly, your plan from the very beginning, your plan for Jesus Christ, who, who was and is and truly is the Messiah, to come into this world to to be the answer of the many, many prophecies, to be the ultimate sacrifice, 
by dying on the cross, shedding his blood, breaking of his body. Lord, and you've instituted the Lord's Supper as laid out before us, not as, as some uh, uh, magic or, or some uh, institution that will ultimately release us from your punishment. Jesus has already done that. But this is an opportunity for us to remember and reflect upon that this morning. And your, Lord, you've encouraged your church family to do that together as a form of worship to you. So, Lord, we thank you for your work that you've done on the cross. And, Lord, especially we thank you that it didn't stop there. That, Lord, after you were died and buried, you were resurrected. And you're living today. You're living in our hearts. You're living through your word. You're seated on the right hand of the Father. And one day, we'll be able to see you again. We pray this in your name. Amen. Feel free to come.
Just a couple of announcements before we leave today. We want to welcome a new little baby into the world, Lily Ann. Uh, parents are Jake and, and Lindsay. Uh, continue to remember Lisa Klein and, and uh, her hospitalization and some of the things going on there and many others in your bulletin. Feel free to look over your bulletin. For activities coming up and thoughts and prayers for this week. Remember the mission team. They're coming home today. Uh, it sounds like they had a great uh, trip and a and, and very encouraging time in Alaska. They're returning home today. Pray for their safe return, their travel. For a benediction this morning, a familiar one from Jude. To him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious present without fault and with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Let's stand as we sing our closing hymn this morning.